And good hello once again, this is LC Lupus with another of these video episodes, whatever you want to call them, a utopian project as I called it, which, you know, would have been called, would have been better to be called the utopian project, but I don't think I have the definitive say on utopia. So it's a utopian project, and this is the 11th video, so um, if you haven't checked out the other ones, it's probably preferable to check those out because they each do go into very specific things. This one is what one of the last ones. It's the second last one. Academia, science, and information. So, when I did the education video, which is the... Let me check which video that was. That was the... Uh, sixth video. The sixth video, I spoke about how, I could, uh, about how education is probably one of the areas that I know the most about because, you know, I've been a teacher for several years. And I would say this, sort of academia is also sort of the, the second area in which I probably know um, the most out of all of these uh, these videos. They're sort of the ones that where uh, I, I'm the closest to an expert. I still wouldn't call myself an expert in absolutely anything at all. But um, the closest to an expert is these two things, I suppose. Um, so, academia, science, and information. Now, um I'm using these terms very, very sort of broadly to mean essentially knowledge that is created by supposedly higher institutions of learning, um, places that are trying to learn more than just the basics. Now, I believe in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Um, learning more is just a good thing. And I think that there is definitely a lot to be learned from learning as much about as many things as possible. I don't think it's a clever idea to completely cut yourself off from any avenue of learning. I think that you should try to pursue learning <clears throat> in every <clears throat> in every sort of area of life, if at all possible, but not everybody feels that way. So people should not be pushed into that. But now, as we spoke about in the sort of second video, the idea of societal functions versus passions, science should be kind of seen in many ways as a passion uh, because it does not necessarily fulfill an immediate societal necessity. Now, yes, developing medicines and what have you is definitely important, um, but I think <clears throat> unless your your societal function is specifically in, you know, vaccine research or developing, you know, anything like that, <clears throat> my throat is being difficult now. Let me have a sip of water. It's not open. Congratulations. Anyway, as I was saying, <clears throat> so, science and um, such. It, uh, unless you're doing something that is, is directly for a specific public benefit, like developing medications, I don't think that it's necessarily incredibly important. Not even, say, development of technologies. Um <clears throat> which are certainly important, but they're not, I wouldn't say, as important as keeping society functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that unless you have a very specific reason for it, that science and academia should remain a passion rather than a societal function. It is something you do because you want to do it. You know, you want to do these things, not because you are uh, compelled to do not you, you're forced to do them because you need to get paid so that you can pay rent. Um, now, for a breakdown of the whole idea of societal functions versus passions that is in previous video so rather if you don't know it you should probably go and check that instead uh, first because with this is going to be viewed more as a passion right now one of the biggest problems with academia right now uh, and that's how we often start many of these is that we talk about what are the actually what are the problems that are actually going on right now in academia and the problems are uh, money uh, money is, of course, a problem that ruins absolutely everything. And money, much like, say, money with art, they don't really go together very, very well. Um, money ruins art, much like money ruins academia. You see, the reason, for instance, that there are a, a handful of climate scientists who claim that um, global warming isn't happening is because they're being paid to say that. Uh, if you get paid enough, you will sell out your morals. People will do that because people are... They want money. Money's nice. You know, it's 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 nice it's nice to have money. I, I like having money. It it means that I can afford food. Um but now without a monetary incentive, things will be a lot better. Now other problems that you find in academia is that for instance, uh, so first off you get those liars and charlatans. If there was no monetary incentive to do so, those people probably wouldn't exist. Right? Your your absolute charlatans who to pretend to to be doing real science, they won't exist anymore. 
You know, um, there's this absolutely fantastic line because you see, uh, science is not just a force for good; it's also a force for evil. <laughs> you know, um, if, if you are an expert, um, but you have a specific um, political bend, and you're also trying to make a certain amount of money from certain people, uh, you might not be entirely truthful. So this would get rid of that if if money. Right, because remember, this society would be a cashless society, so no money whatsoever. In a moneyless society, things would be better in terms of academia because there would be no monetary incentive to to shill for oil companies. You know, there wouldn't be a monetary reason to do that. Um, so that would be that would be good. Hopefully, science would be better uh, without money. Now, also, of course, people who say you know, want to become you know. Uh, any kind of sort of say research scientists doing much more intense kind of stuff should be able to just do it as a passion. They should be able to go to university, learn how to do it, and then do it as as something to try to advance human knowledge as much as possible. And that's something that we should be encouraging. Human knowledge is important in every avenue of human knowledge. You know, there there are things which I don't particularly care about, yet I would never disparage them. You know, um, you know say for instance, you get people who are. Um, uh, as I said many times in this, I, I don't want to swear in this series. So you get many, many people who are um, jerks uh, who try to claim as if that, that certain things, uh, there's no point in learning them because you can't make money off of them. So let's say a lot of the, the, the sciences are like this in many, many ways. You know? You're know, you not really going to be making any money off of doing, uh, you know, um, if you were to study anthropology or sociology or you know, a lot of these kind of subjects, they don't necessarily have a sociology probably is actually the least one, but say anthropology, uh, I don't know, archaeology, uh, linguistics. People will disparage these and sort of claim, oh, that they're they're pointless. Basically, bad people who don't care about knowledge and understanding and learning, and instead only think in terms of profit motives. They will see these things as being pointless, but they are not pointless. They are. Uh, just as important as every other academic field, I I would say, um, because they all advance human knowledge, and isn't that what we should be doing? And many many, you know, um, so say for instance, I study literature, which also a lot of people would claim is that is a pointless thing to learn because you can't use it. Uh, that's fine. Um, I don't care about those people. I mean, I have used it to teach English, which is kind of important to use because it's the, our mode of communication that we use in. in in this particular society, we use language as a mode of communication. But anyway, these are the kind of things that are are not necessarily societally necessary. But that doesn't matter. They should still be given the, the right to exist. And now, say, for instance, with me. Now, I, I do literature. I don't care personally about, say, uh, let's say within literature, right? I don't care about poetry. I'm not a poetry fan. Uh, I, I, when I write fiction, I, I don't really write. I've written a handful of poems, really. I'm not a fan of poetry that much. Um, I wouldn't really sit down and read a poetry book just because it's not really for me. And I also wouldn't really... Um, I, I don't like poetry analysis. I find it overly formalistic and I, I, I find it boring, personally. And also, I don't know why, I literally cannot hear meter. Now, to the people who, who don't know anything about literature, you can just ignore this part. But people who do know something about literature, I can't hear meter. I think it's made up. Iambic pentameter does not exist. Um, it obviously does. I just really struggle to to hear it. But that doesn't mean studies of that nature shouldn't exist just because I don't like it. So if you are, you know, a jerk and you want to try and claim that certain things shouldn't exist because they don't fall within your uh, field of interests, you have an extremely closed-minded aspect uh, mindset. You you don't really think. You're you're just uh, you know. You you you're happy with your ignorance. You you want to be ignorant. You want to be you, you know less informed. Like you are are not the kind of person that society necessarily you know should really encourage. You're the kind of person that would that would act as if knowledge should not exist. That only things that uh, encompass your particular desires should exist. And that's just nonsense. Also. Uh, Kayla has just entered. She's a very old puppy who stays here. Hey, Kegs, do you walk in here? She's very old. She's 14. But she will be a puppy forever. Hey, Kegs. Yes. I love you. Anyway, so um, 
I'm I'm busy. Can you you want to go lie down? Okay. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, academia. So yes, there should not be a monetary incentive. People should be able to create these things. They should be able to work on these things. They should be able to do these things. And also, of course, if you are at all in academia, you know anything about academia, you will know that there's this wonderful little thing called paywalls. If you want to read science, if you want to read anything academic, if you want to learn, you... You, you can't often access this kind of primary information because it's locked behind paywalls. And there, it, it's when you go and take a thing and you're looking for a, an article about something and it says, oh, you can pay $12 for this article or you can pay for a year's membership to like access the site or whatever. That's nonsense. Like information should not be um, guarded like that. It should not be locked away behind paywalls. This is, this, it should be for the benefit of all of humans, not just for the people who can afford to pay for it. Like, academia and science is becoming increasingly inaccessible. People can't, and, and the thing is also people are not taught to be able to, to learn or read these kind of things because they're, they're written in an intentionally obfuscating style. So they're written in language that is intentionally difficult to read like famously a lot of like say philosophy is hard to read it doesn't need to be most philosophy is actually not complicated it's written in a complicated manner because the people who wrote it were pretentious uh, that's why that's why it's difficult they're pretentious they thought too highly of themselves that is what you find with a lot of these kind of people like i have a particular disdain for a lot of continental philosophers because they wrote in such a way to kind of make their language as difficult to understand as possible. Like I have a particular hatred of a man named uh, Jacques Lacan who was a psychologist and philosopher, not psychiatrist and philosopher. Um, but at one point uh, I read a thing where he said that um, he said that he wrote his, his essays and stuff in an intentionally difficult to read style because he didn't want certain people to read it. That is just classist and pretentious. He's pretending that his work is more important than it actually is. That is a big problem that I have with a lot of academia, where you get these people who don't know how to write, and so they write terribly, and they write in a way that tries to, to be like, oh, look how, look how clever I am. Oh, I'm a genius. No one can understand me, possibly. I'm just... I'm too brilliant. Like, they lose in Guattari, a bunch of... Okay, no swearing. Not a lot of swear. Uh, I could rant about this, but it doesn't matter. Let's just stop. But things should be accessible. It should be freely available and written in accessible language, not an intentionally difficult language, because you get some people who will say, oh, it's written like that because it's very, very particular and uh, it would lead to misunderstandings, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. That's absolute nonsense, and that's a very silly argument. Um you do not need to make something complicated to understand. It doesn't make you smarter. Okay, if you use big words, it doesn't mean you're clever. Okay, uh, and that comes from somebody <clears throat> that comes from somebody with an English degree. If you use big words, it does not mean you are clever. Okay, I'm gonna say it one more time. If you use big words because you think it makes you sound clever, it doesn't. Anyway, so yes. Uh, now, also, of course. This kind of information should be disseminated internationally, right? The internet should most, ob like, obviously needs to exist. The internet is an amazing force for good. It's just been used for, like, <laughs> marketing. But the internet is an amazing source because one of the things about the internet, right, is that the internet is a place in which there, there, there is no scarcity. There, there's, no, there's no printing, there, there is no longer actually a need to print books. You can just make an ebook, and it can just be read on any screen, and you could read a million books on one screen. So, like, what's better for the environment? Destroying however many trees took to make a thousand books, or having one screen that can read them all? Like, it is. It's not necessary. It isn't necessary to to make things scarce. That's why, for instance, I think that things like say NFTs is intentionally and just deliberately stupid. It's creating artificial scarcity where none exists. Digital scarcity is an invented concept because data can be endlessly copied. That you you don't need you you know you like a book is never going to disappear if it's on the internet. So why do you you know pretend like it can? You know an image 
an image on the internet is never going to go away. So that is amazing. And that's also why uh, I, for instance, am completely fine with somebody um, pirating anything I write. Uh, like my book that I will flog at the end of this and whatever other books, if you can get them free somewhere, please get them for free. I don't care. It, it's I, I would like people to be able to, to read these things. And when I'm like, so far, all the sort of other stuff I've written is all on the internet. So it's already freely available. But I would want my things to be freely available for anybody to read. Because if you can learn something from it, then that's great. Like, I, I would, I wouldn't, I don't actually want to make money off of anything I make. I want to live in a society where money doesn't exist, where I can just try to, to contribute to knowledge production without having to worry about that kind of, of thing, you know. I want to be able to to do my writing. I want to be able to do all these kind of things without having to worry about money. And and the 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 authors and such who get so angry about people pirating their works, I I don't really have sympathy for it personally, because I think I I'm more than happy for people to pirate my work. I'm like, please, I would rather you pirate it than you than you don't read it at all. You know, um, please go ahead. Uh, at some point, I would actually I want to actually publish my stuff in free avenues, you know, as well. I would love to do that. You know, um, it would be a, a great way to do things. I think that it's much better to to freely provide information rather than to. to that, that's also why, for instance, with YouTube, I think YouTube is a great way to to spread information. Like, there's an absolutely fantastic um, site, which I must actually site uh, site. Um, I'm actually going to write here uh, because I need to to flog his work, Theory and Philosophy. Now, Theory and Philosophy is an absolutely fantastic uh, YouTube channel. It's a a guy whose name I can't remember, I'm sorry, philosophy guy. Um, Fantastic. He, He takes texts and then he disseminates them completely. He goes like chapter by chapter explaining the, the concepts that to make it easier to understand. That kind of stuff is great because it's really, n- nothing is, is complicated. It's made complicated by language. And then he's providing the same information free of charge by creating essentially a secondary source that you can then check out and he'll explain it to you. And that is the kind of stuff that I, I, I want to be much more common. You know, that is the kind of stuff that should be much, much, much more common. That is just a, a fantastic, you know, thing. That is something that should just exist. And um, I love it. So no paywalls, right? None of that. And then, of course, because because there's no money to be made off of academia, you can't have people like... Um, so there's a brilliant example of, of how science can be used badly in a movie called Thank You for Smoking. Thank You for Smoking is a fantastic movie. I would just recommend watching it. It's, it's just brilliant. Uh, it's about the tobacco lobby. But... Um, with with um great now what was i even saying about thank you for smoking i was talking about lobbying oh yeah yeah in the beginning of, of thank you for smoking uh the, the main character is talking about the, how his uh, company the the industry uh, ugh, the academy of tobacco studies is a uh, they, they basically hire lawyers and that they're a lobbying company obviously so they they hire um they hire lawyers they hire scientists all that kind of stuff and they have a guy and I don't know why, but I can kind of remember it for like word for word. And he says, um, you know, then there's this guy, Eric Hart van Gruppentmund. I don't know why I remember his name. Uh, and they say, and then let's see if I can remember this word for word. Um, they found him in Germany. Um, the man's a genius. He could disprove gravity. Um, oh, yeah, actually, he first says you know, he's been testing the link between like lung cancer and, and tobacco smoke for like 20 years. And he's found no conclusive results. Um, the man's a genius. He could disprove gravity. Science, if done right, can disprove or, or make difficult certain things. Because that, that, you might think, oh, that's a silly little thing. That's what really happened. Like the tobacco industry funded a lot of this research into like lung cancer and stuff and was like, oh, no, it's the, 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 the evidence is inconclusive. So we, we haven't found direct links. And that's also the thing. Like there isn't necessarily a direct link. Like if you smoke, you are not going to get cancer. Like it's not a one-to-one causal thing. Your your chances increase, but you can't actually say smoking equals cancer because it doesn't. 
it increases quite massively depending on how much you smoke. It increases the chances that you could get cancer, but you won't just get cancer because you smoke. And so companies like tobacco companies could hide behind that and sort of be like, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, there, there's, there's no uh, conclusive evidence that uh, smoking definitely causes cancer. That is just something that's obviously made up by the, by the, this liberal cabal who, who are just out to get us because, of course, they are, you know, they, they, they don't uh, agree with our, our American values of liberty and, and, and slowly killing yourself with a cigarette, you know, but without the monetary incentive why the hell would a scientist be like i'm gonna try and help prove that cigarettes are fine to smoke forever like that's just not gonna happen you know uh why why would you why would you do that like what would be the point so you know i i think that's quite an interesting little little thing there <laughs> you know uh, that that there wouldn't be any fake science. There wouldn't be people who work for lobby, uh, like lobbying companies for like lobbyists, sort of uh, explaining away reality. You know, being like, oh no, you see, there's there's the the reason that that uh, you know uh, carbon emissions are actually good for the environment is because uh, uh, plant plants 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 uh, don't you know that plants plants eat uh, CO two? So actually, if we reduce the amount of CO two, we're actually really harming the plants. Um, I mean, you know, you get just pe the worst kind of people who don't, who have no morals, who will completely sell th their qualifications for a for a few cents, you know. And that is a terrible thing that happens. People will will use their qualifications, and then of course you can use your. There's that one guy. Um, can't remember his name now. He was a, a a founding member of like Greenpeace Canada, I think, and he's now like, I think it's one of those things where he's technically not a lobbyist, but he is basically a lobbyist. Um, and and he's just a liar. He uses the fact that he was a co-founder of Greenpeace, which is obviously an environmental company. He uses that as sort of a smokescreen so that he can, you know lie and be like well i i i was part of the environmental movement and and you know obviously i saw through all the lies and that's why i've left so you're using the sort of more academic knowledge or your credentials or what have you you're using them as a way of of lying of 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 pushing the an agenda that is that is wrong and if there was no money in, in academia then that wouldn't happen you know and also of course there is the the big other issue is that um Tuition is expensive. It, it shouldn't be. It, it shouldn't cost anything. People should be able to learn without having to go into debt. Like, I am very, 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 uh, very lucky that I have never had to go into debt for, for any of my um, university education. Now, I didn't get to go to a campus university because I didn't have a rich relative bankrolling me. Um, and I was unwilling to go into debt. I, to this day... I'm in my late 20s and I don't have a single shred of debt, which is actually really bad in society because you, you're supposed to have good debt. I have none. I've never had a contract anywhere in my life. I have zero debt, which turns out isn't actually very good in society. You're supposed to have debt, but I don't. And um, that's because I've, I, I grew up with, with somebody who was in massive debt and it was extremely scary. And I grew up being like, no, debt is literally the worst thing that you could ever do to yourself. So I refused to ever go into debt. Um, and then I was thankfully helped by a relative, um, but not to go to a campus university. I was helped to go to a, a place called UNISA in South Africa, which is a correspondence university. I did my entire undergrad, then my honors, and now my master's through a correspondence university, which is significantly cheaper than going through a campus university like significantly the costs are massively reduced and also it, i i think it's better run but anyway that's the kind of thing like there should be like information should be freely disseminated you should be able to learn whatever the hell you want you shouldn't be restrained by the monetary nonsense that because the, these companies these universities and they are companies are run like businesses when they shouldn't be you know, it's the same as like hospitals should not be run as businesses. Health should not be a business. Do you know what a business should be? Fast fashion. But also, of course, fast fashion shouldn't exist because I've explained that in a previous video. But anyway, it shouldn't be about making money because that's disgusting. 
it's absolutely disgusting that only sort of upper class people can really go to university. It's 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 difficult for for poor people to go to university because they don't have the money to do it. And you might immediately say, oh well, yeah, if 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 they, if they worked hard, they they would be able to to get a bursary to go. First off, do you know how hard it is to get a bursary? Number two, um, you have to be like really good often to get a bursary. And thirdly, a lot of, say, say South Africa, South Africa is a good example of this. Um, South Africa's education system is terrible because what happens in our education system is that, I, I remember this from when I was in my, my final year you know, uh, final year in uh, high school, so my matric year. When I was in that year, there was a big, big news story about um, uh, Limpopo. Limpopo is a province in South Africa. I live in the Western Cape. I live in Cape Town. Limpopo is further to the to the east. And um, there was this whole thing because the other, the, the, the grade 12s, the matric students in Limpopo had not received their textbooks and they didn't receive them until like halfway through the year. And now the thing is, can you really expect somebody who was not even given the study material to do well, and so first off, they have terrible teachers because the education in this country isn't very great. Um, they have terrible teachers who are not good at their jobs. They have terrible pretty much everything, you know, because if you don't get textbooks, if you don't get to have uh, good desks, if you don't have good teachers, if you don't have good facilities, there, there are places on this planet where people have been taught coding without ever touching a computer that is a thing that has happened in this in this world in this continent on this continent where in africa there have been places where people have been taught and they will get like a master's degree in computer engineering and they've never touched a computer they, they learned all of it through essentially theory how can that person possibly compete with somebody who was from a richer country who got to have a computer given to them when they were seven years old you know these are things that are, are matter. Like education is extremely classist in this current uh, in this current system, but it shouldn't be. There should be no class aspect to education. Everybody should be educated. At the moment, it, you, you're seen as like a a pompous person when you have an education, and I can understand that. People with educations tend to be very classist. They do. It's 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 a it's an inbuilt thing where where. To you, it's obvious, you know, that you, you've been taught in this academic way and you meet people who don't think in that ac academic way. And so you think, oh, there, there must be less intelligence, whatever, but they're not. They were not given the same resources that you were given. You should be thanking whatever you believe in that you were given the privilege of learning. But learning should not be a privilege. In our current system, class plays a major role in education, but it shouldn't. It should be for everybody. It should be freely available. And it should be available to everybody who wants to learn. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end there. <sighs> uh, this has been Elsie Lupus. So uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter, I suppose, at Elsie underscore Lupus. Uh, Twitter for me ranting about random nonsense, and Instagram if you want to see pictures of nature and dogs, um, and sometimes cats as well when they look cute when they're sleeping. Anyway, um, you can also check out my book. Uh, the Cyborg Wilderness is linked below. It's all about a post-apocalyptic world in which a solitary cyborg survivor is um, trudging through the grey wasteland looking for some kind of hope. It's a, it's a, it's ultimately a hopeful story, even if it is a bit sad. And it's also written in a very stunted style. Um, you know, you can check out the description. It'll explain all that kind of stuff. Um, and then do the YouTube things, please. The like, comment, subscribe, uh, share, do those things. Uh, and yeah, I hope this has been informative and uh, goodbye. I hope that you have an absolutely great day, week, and month ahead. And ta-ta.